Welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the ERC Intensive Part 2, the second day. Uh, the first part was amazing today. Thank you, Bruno. This is really nice. We had great performances, um, heard great lectures. Um, now part two, um, it's with uh, Taru Elvin and Paulina Fedorov, who were part of the Earth Intensive last year in March, and uh, also part of the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Art and Climate Change. And uh, Taru Elvin was in the group of the present, and Pauline was in the group of the future. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Welcome both, Pauline and Taro. I will uh, just um, read out your bios. And um, So Taro Elvin is a curator and writer based in Helsinki, uh, focusing on nurturing undisciplinary and site-sensitive inquiries at the intersections of ecological, feminist, and decolonial practices. As artistic director of CAA Contemporary Arts Archipelago, Elvin is currently leading the research residency program Spectres in Change on the island of Saili in the Baltic Sea in collaboration with Archipelago Research Institute of Turku University. Welcome, Taro. Paulina Fedorov is a Skolt Sami theater director, artist and nature guardian. Her multidisciplinary work joins various fields of knowledge, Sami, traditional, artistic, scientific as a methodology in her work in theater and film, but also in political activism, such as ecological restoration projects. Thank you very much. Welcome, Taru. Welcome, Pauline. I'll give it to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, the invitation for us to return. Um, this is actually very strange because we see ourselves only now on the screen in, in kind of a <laughs> it's threefold. Um, but it would be uh, wonderful to be there in person to be able to really join in in all the discussions um, live. But here we are. At least we are having kind of able to join now from the same room in Helsinki, which is a uh, uh, joy in itself. Um, and so uh, uh, we thought that um, I'll start with a few notes, uh, reflecting a little bit on, on on kind of thinking also developed actually since the last urgency intensive year and a half ago, um, and uh, and also um, thinking back a little bit to the wonderful keynote lecture last night uh, that I was really happy to um, be able to also listen to. Uh, and then I'll pass on to Paulina after this. Some years ago in 2016, I was invited to visit an island in the middle of the archipelago of thousands of islands located off the southwest coast of Finland in the Baltic Sea. I was invited there together with my long-term colleague and friend, artist uh, and filmmaker Lotta, Lotta Petronella, by a senior scientist who was about to retire from his post as the director of the Archipelago Research Institute housed on this island. He said to us, as scientists, we have failed. This is what Professor Ilko Vorinen felt after 50 years of work as a marine biologist producing research that revealed the extent of the rapid transformations in the marine ecosystems caused by a lethal combination of the impact of climate change, overfishing and uh, nutrient runoff from industry, agriculture and forestry into the Baltic Sea. In his lifetime, the sea had changed dramatically. And with his colleagues across the globe, they had given clear scientific evidence of the changes and their causes. But it seemed to him that hardly anybody had listened. Their work had not led to the needed societal changes in the face of the escalating climate emergency. He believed that we needed to work across disciplinary boundaries and that scientists needed artists to join this collective labor towards cultural change. This is where I have been working for the past five years together with contemporary artists and scientists and, and mainly scientists from um, natural sciences. The island of Sely, um, in Swedish, Stjela, the island of souls or the island of seals, is a microcosm that reflects both the acute planetary challenges and specific local phenomena of the present against complex historical and future trajectories. In early 17th century, the island was instituted as a leper colony to isolate people suffering from leprosy. For centuries, it operated as a hospital that no one left as this was the place where those deemed uncurable were sent. Since late 19th century, it was a mental asylum exclusively for women, 
until the 1960s, when the hospital closed and the biologists of Turku University moved in to study the changing marine environment. For the arts and humanities, it is quite impossible to focus on the environmental urgencies here without reflecting them also against this history of biopolitical institutions. About a decade ago, the research institute on the island started to compare their long-term time series of data and showed clearly how climate change is impacting the local marine ecosystem in complex ways. The average tem temperature of the sea is already 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer here than in the 1960s when they started taking measurements. Increasing rainfall is lowering the salinity of the sea. The herring are growing increasingly smaller. IPCC models are conservative, their research argues with its local data. Focus on the global average is problematic. After working with the scientists on the island for some years now, I would argue that the scientists have not failed. Rather, the institutional structures within which the ecological emergency is addressed and the practices of this address are part of the problem. As Bio beautifully put it in his keynote lecture last night, what if the way we engage with the crisis is the crisis? I would argue that this applies also to the arts. Here in Europe, the institutional and ideological frameworks in the arts are inseparable from the colonial legacies that are alive in science. <clears throat> Our work in dialogue with the scientists in the island itself has been led by questions that demand critical self-reflection self in the face of the urgencies that we hope to respond to. How to land on the island without presuming access? What kind of guidance do we need in order to be able to arrive there respectfully? What kind of rituals or protocols need to be learned or recreated for us to gain permission to enter? How to work against the logic of extraction when building a relationship with the ecosystem or the history of the island or with the work of the scientists or any other forms of local knowledge? What kind of temporal commitments and processes this requires? The scientific papers and data communicate only a fraction of the knowledge that is accumulated by the scientists during long-term and cross-generational fieldwork in the studied environment. And it mediates very little of the deep care for the more than human community they work with, or the awareness of their own interdependent relations as part of it, or the many ethical dilemmas they deal with day to day. This relationship with care and embodied multisensory knowledge based on practices of long-term embedded observation has become a powerful bond between artists and scientists, as well as a focus of research by the artists on the island. The gaps in the data, like the voices of the patients missing from the old hospital archives, are ghosts that the arts have significant potential and specific capacities to address. These hauntings at the edges of knowledge are openings both for collaboration across disciplinary boundaries and for cultural change. They have led us to ask time and again, how do we know what we know? How and what to draw into the field of vision, field of attention, and to make sensible while working against the violence of capture and withholding the urge to name. In the past five years, we have witnessed yet another turn on the island, the arrival of tourism, accelerated by the focus on, on local travel during the pandemic. Long-term fieldwork is seen as expensive and inefficient within the neoliberalized university. Machines can capture the data while scientists can stay in a lab. Is the body of the scientists now becoming increasingly ghostly? The artist duo Metallurgy have asked us on the island. This ongoing work on the island, together with many other conversations alongside it, such as the last year's urgency incentive and my ongoing dialogue with Paulina, have now guided, guided me to focus on developing what I tentatively call undisciplinary methods of retreat and field work to nurture collective work towards cultural change in carefully grounded ways. There is an urgent need to develop articulations and keep due attention to the myriad ways that the arts are actively responding to the socio-ecological urgencies today. So a specific focus needs to be drawn to situated long-term practices 
that do not either neither easily mold themselves into the institutional frameworks of representation in the arts, nor produce recognizable outcomes within them. Moreover, support structures have to be developed for connecting practices that are embedded in and com committed to work with specific local more than human communities, so as to allow for them also access to wider community of peers. But I would argue that the silos of different disciplines of practice are also at the heart of the crisis. The speculative proposal of the fourth working group, as distinct from the others, cannot necessarily address this problem. We need undisciplined alliances, methodologies, time and space. Thank you. I'll pass on to Paulina now. Thank you, Karu. Uh, maybe I just then continue yeah. from where you start, uh, stopped. Uh, um, before going to my, what I prepared some thoughts for you, I just want to uh, re recall or tell you about an uh, event Taru organized more than a month ago in Seili, in uh, Seoul Island and, or Seal, uh, Seal Island as Taru put it, uh, she organized a day's visit for fellow artists and uh, researchers to come and follow uh, the work that had been going on in Seili for years now. Uh, one of the events I chose to participate in, uh, into was uh, a small gathering of women that had circled in a small forest that was uh, doomed to be locked. And the women were using their own voices and a few acoustic sound bites to hum with the forest or as uh, the leader of the work or the, who had designed the work said that um, to mourn, mourn with the trees. Uh, sitting on the ground or watching the, or witnessing the event, what's, what uh, stayed with me the most was the realization that um, when the women started to sing uh, without any amplification, electro electrolytical or electric amplification to the sound, uh, the ants from the crown started to pay attention what is going on and they visually stopped what they were doing and started to listen uh, with, their, with their sensors. And uh, starting or coming from that, uh, I think that uh, I'm listening for you uh, today, which, uh, which has been a privilege and a pleasure. Uh, coming from uh, my background as uh, one of the indigenous peoples in the European continent, and coming from a tradition that is uh, scattered and scattered and many is broken but still uh, it is a living tradition we never gave up in as a collective of our way of life i i consider when i'm listening to you that the western art or the the way the west is now turning into art is trying to form a bridge how to navigate and how to speak with mother nature. And since, uh, since even the science is doing it nowadays, best of the scientists are doing it nowadays, but still some kind of a, in a secrecy or with blinded folds somehow, I think that uh, that bridge needs to be rebuilt between the larger cultures and the nature again, or the land again, and whatever role and whatever background everybody is coming from, all the efforts are needed now more than ever. And I might start with the two video clips that I have sent you that was uh, made as a commission piece uh, some years back. Uh, one of my closest collaboration partners uh, while standing here in front of you and speaking to you, there's always a line lineage of people that I work with and none of my or very few of my thoughts are just solely my thoughts. It's a combination and network of 
discussions and findings that I, I'm just sharing here. And one of the frameworks that I'm coming from is the work of uh, What Form Can an Atom Intake Project that has 22 participants, including uh, uh, plus me. And the second uh, community that I work closely with is a Snow Change Cooperative. Uh, Snow Change Cooperative started their work concerning uh, about collecting the local uh, observations of the effects of climate change in the end of the 1990s. And now, 20 years later, it's one of the few and um, leading voices uh, in the both scientific and traditional knowledge actors globally and locally. And uh, this clip that I'm going to show you about is uh, 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 illust an illustration of a scientific report that was uh, uh, ordered by the different uh, state governing organs about how the indigenous peoples of the Arctic are seeing the uh, climate effects of climate change and how how do we frame the climate change and when, when the report was published the one who has asked for that said that that cannot be published because uh, the framing of the current situation is too different from the framing that the governments and the scientists having so instead of trying to edit in a more moderate way we decided to publish in it on our own and one of the ways of trying to bring the report into larger audiences has been this short movie clip and maybe you just run it before i explain more about that Tämä Tero ja Kaisu Mustosen kirjoittama yhteenveto dokumentoi ja esittelee perinteistä tietoa, havaintoja ja näkökulmia useista arktisista alkuperäiskansayhteisöistä. Useat yhteisöt ja kylät ovat olleet tietoisia ja osallistuneet tämän dokumentin kokoamiseen eri tavoin, esimerkiksi yhteisöpohjaisten työpajojen kautta, puhelimitse ja suoraan vaikuttamalla siihen, mitä ja kuinka heidän tietojaan on käytetty raportissa ja sen kokoamisen aikana. Ne eri tsuktsi, saamelais, jukagiiri, etenki ja muut yhteisöt, perheet ja yksityishenkilöt, jotka ovat jakaneet materiaalejaan tämän dokumentin tarpeisiin, pidättävät luonnollisesti kaikki tekijänoikeudet sekä nykylainsäädännön että perinteisen tapaoikeuden mukaan luovuttamiensa tietojen osalta. Turvallisuussyistä osa raportin informanttien nimistä on muutettu. Staalokansan päällikkö Steven Point pohti luonnonsuojeluun ja arktisiin alkuperäiskansoihin liittyviä kysymyksiä. Point painotti, että eri näkökulmien ymmärtämisen keskiössä on avoin keskustelu, dialogi. Kahden täysin erilaisen maailmankäsityksen välille tarvitaan vuoropuhelua, jotta meille olisi mahdollista ymmärtää toinen toisiamme. Se hetki on käsillä. Yritys vuoropuheluun, eräänlainen kulttuurinen tapaaminen, kenties kohtaaminen eri tietojärjestelmien välillä. Tätä keskustelua ei ole vielä käyty. When Alexei thinks about his native or Tukchi relationship with the land, how is it like? What does the tundra mean to that? 
А что значит тундра для шкотского народа? Вот какое значение тундры шкотский народ придает? Какое отношение? Raivataksemme tilaa uudenlaisille näkemyksille siitä, kuinka alkuperäiskansa yhteisöt ovat yhteydessä kotiseutualueisiinsa. Eveeni tiedemies Vasili Robbek Sahan tasavallasta eli Jakutiasta Siperiasta tarjoaa merkityksellisen ja tarpeellisen teoreettisen näkökulman. Robbek muotoili kalottialueen alkuperäiskansa sivilisaatioiden sijainnin seuraavasti. Se valtava muutos paimentolaisuudesta maanviljelys- ja kaupunkikulttuuriin, siis metsästys- ja keräilykulttuurista paikalleen asettumiseen, joka alkoi noin 10 000 vuotta sitten, paljastaa oleellisimman muutoksen ihmisen suhteessa luontoon koko olemassaolomme aikana. Hänen mukaansa Euraasian viimeiset paimentolaiset, nenetsit, tsuktsit, eveenit ja jukagiirit, voivat yhä omata toisenlaisen ymmärryksen luonnosta ja siten myös maailmasta. Vasili Robbekin mukaan alkuperäiskansojen perinteisen elämysmaailman ilmenemismuodot ovat kokonaisvaltaisia. Luontoa säästävät perinteemme läpäisevät koko ihmisen elonkehän ja elämäntavat. Ne pitävät sisällään Euraasian paimentolaiskulttuurien käytöstavat, Moraalin ja etiikan. Vaikka meri erottaa Euraasian Pohjois-Amerikasta, eri alueiden alkuperäiskansojen kulttuurien välillä on enemmän yhteneväisyyksiä kuin eroavaisuuksia. Voidaan puhua arktisten alkuperäiskansojen tiedosta, vaikka jokaisella kansalla on toki oma erityinen kulttuurinsa. Heti alusta lähtien on tärkeää todeta, että kalottialueen eri kansoilla on olemassa omat kotoperäiset, niin sanotut hallintajärjestelmänsä suhteessa ympäröivään luontoon. Tällaisia ovat esimerkiksi saamelaisten siirajärjestelmä, tsuktsien alueellinen järjestäytyminen, jukagiirien klaanialueet ja inupiak inuittien kansalliset kotiseutualueet luoteisalaskassa. Nämä olivat ja jossain määrin vieläkin muodostavat vastavuoroisuuteen perustuvia henkisiä järjestelmiä ihmisen ja luonnon välillä. Alkuperäiskansojen omia hallintamenettelyjä ei pitäisi sekoittaa nykyaikaisiin luonnonsuojelutoimiin. Ylipäätään nykyajattelun soveltaminen alkuperäiskansojen perinteestä kumpuaviin omiin järjestelmiin on tehtävä varoen. Kulttuurinen kuilu on merkittävä. Osasta kalottialuetta alkuperäiskansojen omaehtoiset hallintamenettelyt ovat kokonaan kadonneet. Joillakin alueilla ne ovat toiminnassa osittain. Ne ovat pääosin vielä voimissaan muutamissa Siperian yhteisöissä. Näissäkin järjestelmissä on omat ongelmansa ja virheitä tapahtui. Ne olivat, niin kuin kaikki ihmisyhteisöt ja yhteiskunnat ovat, haavoittuvia ja herkkiä sekä täysin riippuvaisia ympäröivistä olosuhteista. Oleellista on, että nämä järjestelmät onnistuivat ylläpitämään arktiset ekosysteemit suhteellisen terveinä ja tuottavina arktisen alueen laajamittaiseen kolonisaatioprosessiin asti. Asuminen Thank you for the technical aid in sharing the videos. Uh, when a collective still possesses some kind of uh, understanding or practices, living practices, how to manage the relationship between a man and the environment in a manner that is not destructive. Uh, and if you happen to be born into that kind of a uh, society, uh, I think that there's there's very little or not at all space for cho choosing whether or not it becomes your life goal to try to protect or and strengthen the bits and pieces of that system that is still functioning. And uh, I'm going to share some examples of that work. Before going 
in the few slides or pictures that I prepared for you, I just shortly tell that um, I highly appreciate my fellow colleague in a previous presentation about the, the profound mentioning of the, about the Russia's uh, current situation towards her indigenous groups, uh, which is devastating. And that has also greatly affected my work since uh, most of our tribe's traditional lands reside on the Russian soil, current uh, so-called Russian soil, uh, as, as in the soils of current Norway. We were forcibly relocated from those areas after the Second World War because that place became to be a geopolitical hotspot due to the nickel that was so vital for the wartime mining. Uh, that area has been closed after the Iron Curtain uh, in the Soviet times because it became to be one of the highest concentration points of nuclear weapons and missiles and a whole peninsula full of closed cities that were a crucial part of the threat targeted to NATO and West. Since the collapse of Soviet Union, the doors opened for a while, uh, the access, ability to access the traditional lands was easing up a bit and, uh, and we were able to, the living people who were still remembering the places from their childhood and youth, they were able to visit their old traditional lands just to be facing the fact that there is pre pretty much nowhere else left to go since the mining industry had created an environmental destruction, a catastrophe. Uh, during the Soviet times, uh, also the Sami tribes, as so many other Russian indigenous groups, faced the destiny of going, sent, being sent into Kulak camps and also their private property, including their livelihoods of reindeer, fishing catmens, hunting catmens were confiscated and made to be a collective part of the state. Um, that uh, Sovietization and its effects for our fellow brothers and sisters uh, behind the border was merely starting to heal at some time before the madman's decision to invade Ukraine. It's, now it feels so absurd to understand that uh, only one year ago, a half, half, uh, half year before the invasion and the war started, we were still seriously planning to start building up a private um, protection site on the Suoniel soil, which is my people's traditional lands currently in Russia. Uh, now I start sharing the screen and hope I'm able to do that. Uh, since no one of us can choose our birth place of becoming to be alive and our background, we just we can just try to make best out of it. And uh, after the forced exile, a uh, whole generation of men of my, my current age uh, choose to kill themselves because they were men in general are, uh, were, they have so much harder time to accept the big land losses and the loss of the basis of traditional, the access to traditional livelihoods and basis for self-sustaining their families. So all of my life, my artist, artistic practice coming from a theater background, I, I moved to Helsinki, capital of Finland, as 18 years old to study theater, has been how to bring back the still existing and functioning pieces of my people's self decision making organ called the CEDA. And the last five years, we have been working with the project called What Forms Can an Atonement Take? Uh, that has been funded by Kone Foundation. That year, it was the biggest 
uh, funding for comment pay, uh, that, that is invested in the culture uh, or arts. And somehow trying to like fast forward 20 years of time, just climbing through the ladders of art, getting in, within the Finnish art funding system, a position through my artistic practice that could outdo my ethnic, ethnicity and my ethnic background. Since the work that we have been doing now five years has been impossible to do out, outside of art context because it has been seen uh, depending on who is answering to too political, too risky or too uninteresting. What forms can an atonement take has three different dimensions. It sets a firm belief that if we are giving space to traditional Sami land turning practices, whether it be concerning the watershed and water management, or what it be considering of forest management, the man-made uh, damages that have already been done in the Sami area will start to recover. Uh, it comes with the two understandings. Uh, effects of war in the Finnish soil, current Finnish soil in the Sami home area are done with the logging. Uh, since the war repatriations that Finland had to pay for Soviet Union were paid uh, with pulp and pulp is made from wood and the only so-called uh, free wood uh, material came from Sapmi. And the second, second uh, issue has been oh, oh, obviously mining. But in order to go back to these traditional practices, how to undo mistakes, how to renew, how to heal something that is done for the land, uh, is always site specific. Uh, there is no general rule how to do it. Uh, it has to be, or the answer or the methodology comes through the history, what has happened to a place and how to undo something without knowing it is impossible. So how to track down the mistakes that, that were done in the past and try to make new nature or redeem it out of that. And therefore the third part of the work in uh, our project has been somehow the renewal or re-strengthening of memory. Both memory of the how world used to be and secondly uh, what has led to us into it, this situation. And obviously the last question is loaded a lot of with a lot of pain and hurt and anger. And at the same time, the first question, how world used to be, can be a source of sense of loss, but also a sense of uh, hope and joy when having time to properly inspect them both. But the major uh, uh, obligation that I had, have had in this work, being the leader of this work, whether it be the art, so-called artistic project or not, has been the same fact that by the people that gave their voices to the report of life in the cyclic work in the snow change when they were interviewed during the time of 2001 and 2020, uh, 21, the time period of 20, 20 years. They were saying it's not enough if you merely observe the effects of climate change. It's not, it's not enough if you just follow up what is happening. And it's not enough if you collect our traditional histories and stories. You have to act to buy us more time. You have to act in order to ensure that some of the seeds of the life will still prevail. So the group of 20 one plus myself, there was land, Sami land care practices, meaning reindeer herders, Sami fishermen, Sami mothers, 
uh, combined uh, with the scientists, meaning in this case, there was a professor of uh, uh, forest economy, um, professor of law or justice, how do you, how do you call that, juridical professor, um, then uh, conflict resolving uh, docent, and um, one who has been developing a system how to combine different technologies combined with the satellite images, wrong color images, terminal images. Se on niin kauko, kauko tarkkailu tuolta. Kauko tarkkailu, mikähän se olisi nyt englanniksi? No, I don't have the, I'm sorry, I don't find the word now in English. It has been a long day, but if you know what I mean, how we use the satellite information and the information taking above and how to combine, combine all that satellitic uh, information to make sense. So th that was the first, first working group concentrating on the Mutusjärvi forest Saamin lands. Mutusjärvi is a Anasami community consisting of 50 watt whatsoever families that are still actu uh, actively reindeer herding and the picture background you're seeing is from the area. After the Second World War, 60% of the Mudusjärvi reindeer pastures have been locked for pulp. And in this project, why the Mudusjärvi people wished to collaborate with me was that, that because they have been saying for decades that the, the, the changes that is happening to their livelihoods is detrimental, not only their livelihoods, but also their culture and all, all the ecosystems surrounding the area. Uh, so we needed to witness or have the burden of proof in this work. And therefore we took in the scientists and my part as an artist was to document the work that the, if the science has been done, it would not be sealed under, under some kind of a science magazine and then be all forgotten about. Uh, second part of the work has been uh, concentrating on the watershed of Njautam River, Nelin River, which is a border river between Finland and Norway. And one of its substreams called Vamike River, Vainosjoki, was brought in the 1960s in order to create easier passage for timber floating. And also it was thought during that time that the uh, Trout and salmon would prefer to have more narrow, uh, uh, no, sorry, more straightforward pathway for their spam. But as a surprise, the whole river partially vanished instead. Uh, and in the Nautam River, we started to uh, started to work by observing the local impacts of climate change, but in a little by little going more forward and finding out the history, what has happened to the watershed area that has officially been said to be uh, untouched uh, wild mark. And finding out the history because there were no proper documenting or it was not common knowledge that these waters were actually modificated. So finding out the history and the identifying the places that have been modified and actually in a four meter or four kilometers uh, of length there was almost 130 modificated places that needed to be restored and the second issue with the Mudusjärvi reindeer herding cooperative and their forests was that they wished to have a cumulative impact assessment made, showing that uh, if you just look at one logging at time or one forestry road at time, but you never have all the impacts during the time period of for say 50 years at, or at least 20 years, put all together in map, you will never have a fully understanding that there's no more space left to have new projects or have new loggings. So the cumulative impact 
impact assessment done in the Mutusjärvi reindeer herding cooperative with the goal of changing land management practices for good. And one of the tools for doing that was a new pasture revalving plan for Mutusjärvi, which is not give a, just a critique for the state, but also a show a new way forward. And in order to do that, the same kind of a mapping of the status quo, what is happening, or the status, what is happening there right now, meaning that, uh, no, I don't go in there yet. Uh, and the work in whole project uh, it follows primarily the, not only the territory of the ancient Sami Siva territories, which has been the traditional self-governing organ of all the Sami groups, the Skolt Sami being the last one to have it functioning until 1944. But it's also the governance system, a reawakening that, that uh, governance systems also within Europe, how to interact with the landscapes, ecosystems, and traditions that are guiding human interactions. And, this, and what <laughs> sarcastically or uh, tragically opened up, uh, made an opening for us to do this work, what is the climate crisis? Since the uh, funders are also craving for new openings, so we are somehow packaging the old ways of doing things into new format. Because um, what the current system, current governance system in Scandinavia, and in this case, Finland particularly, uh, it gives us no power to take part on the water, water or forest management. The power is, is now to the, uh, in the Finnish constitution invested for the Finnish authorities. At the same time, it takes away our responsibility to take care of, of those areas. And in this work, uh, I, I need to be very focused before I start to go in the too many directions, but in this work we have showed that, that even though the feminist government has taken the authority, they don't take the responsibility for addressing the changes and act, act, addressing the damages and the uh, breaks in the change of life that we need to have healthy, especially now when the abnormalities in the weather patterns will be a continuous new normal. Uh, So, instead of trying to have a juridical right for to do that, we chose to have a very practical approach to have indigenous rights uh, acknowledged in this case. So that we got the funding from the art project for start making a pilot study, pilot area of restoring parts of the Vanike River, the Vinos River, and recreating the lost 130 uh, spawning sites. And as you can see, it was done by hand. Uh, the guys draw with snow scooters, uh, rubble to the banks of the river, and in the summertime, the these big boulders, the blo blocks that were taken away in the 1960s uh, that in order to have a better passage for the timber were pushed away, pushed back to the river that slowed down the current and then a new gravel was put there in, in the place, more, more gravel. And uh, what happened was that the trout started to come back to spawn after the first, very first autumn. And we didn't start by just studying with this, this is the end result, as you can see that the nine years prior that our team uh, gathered traditional knowledge and observations 
how the land is changing and get water diaries, weather diaries, catch diaries. We made lots of in interviews, temperature diaries and measurements of heavy metal on the waters in order to understand that have we fully grasped the situation. And one of the things that Mike said, well, what is art, why is art useful in this case? It's not only that the, the funding came through the art or my that the, I was able to get art funding, but the, only just the, the, how to make this a narrative that is followable for people, because this is no iconic river. It was like a, seen as a, like a, somebody's backyard that is a bit messy. How to make something that has been considered for 50 years of time to be insignificant, to be significant again. And how to build that in a story that is true, that is accurate, that is not like sweeten, sweetening up things because climate change or indigenous rights are important. And as many indigenous people holders, knowledge holders say that uh, uh, if indigenous people, if, if the knowledge is not precise and if it's not true, it's worthless. And therefore you must never lie when you talk about nature. Um, so how to build up in a story that would uh, not function as a story as entertainment, but how to make the story in a way that it would make this whole work possible and at the same time maybe act as an inspiration for other. Because this is just a mere one example to show that this is doable, the man-made local changes can be undone and it can be done collectively. And as you can see in the picture, there are all men that are doing the physical work. Plus myself and Stina Aletta Aikio, who was filming and sometimes being in the river as well. And this kind of work that has been done to nature with big machines or caterpillars is made, mostly made by men. So it's so essential to include the men for the healing process as well. Men as the knowledge holders and men as the key actors as well. Uh, yeah. So then one of the things when we were doing this, this kind of a things, I, I forgot to, I have forgotten to put one more slice there, telling about the work in uh, Mudusjärvi, the forest, forest work. Uh, during the five years of time, we were able to monitor in five, oh, sorry, four meters accuracy, what is the actual status on that area uh, using this, all the meteorology of looking from above and including 52,000 photographs taken by 50,000 photos taken by Johan Landsman and around 2,000 photos taken by Jan Sayets and others. Uh, the methodology that has been created by the Sami researcher um, Jan Sayets. So it has been showing that uh, uh, during the time period of 70 years, six, like I said, 60%, over 60% of that land reserve is gone. And of, obviously the locking is based on the assumption that uh, when something is locked, it will go back. But the thing that has been never been monitored and nobody has taken the responsibility to actually follow up that has the pine, Scottish pine forests in this area, have they renewed themselves? And what the research that we have been doing here has shown now uh, that partially there have been no renewal at all. So that leads to a situation that uh, it's a one-time game. When you lock these forests, it might take 500 years, 300 years, who knows, but nobody has lived to see the natural rebirth of that cycle. And so the planning, uh, the current forest management is based on a false assumption or a hope that it will go back. 
and this work has shown that it does not. So the new plan of saving the Mudisjärvi grazing lands is having the, its first, uh, like a first thought that the, all existing old growth forests that are the seed for the upcoming new forests need to be spared at least for a hundred years of time in order to see what happens then. Uh, like I said that the, in this process, one of the aspects, how to find a narrative to communicate about this uh, issues in a manner that would end up in a profound and lasting change in the land managing practices was to use the language of economy and uh, economical loss that was first time calculated here was uh, the one just one cooperative just one time cooperative loses over 300,000 euros per year and we have to remember that they are reindeer herders their main product is selling the reindeer meat and the reindeer hides and it's not a big money business so they lose every year more due to the loggings because they have to buy additional food because they have no normal winter, winter pastures then they are almost able to gain and the same time we, our group professor Oli Tahonen did not only just calculate the loss that is come from the logging but he also calculated uh, what is the price for these forests to bind to carbon if the coal uh, market or CO2 is certain in the markets and uh, with the current rate uh, it is already now uh, unprofitable to log these forests and when you are able to show that uh, in the same time one, one part of this work was to go through also the existing legislation and I found out that all, already the current existing legislation in Finland gives some the tools to promote uh, to protect themselves of this irrationality, but for some reason the Finnish officials don't know the Finnish constitution and they don't follow it. So having these legal and economical arguments and find out that the, they they both are on the Sami side of the story, then and still the logging practices are not changed. The only question is that, that what is the ideology behind loggings? Uh, meanwhile, us the artists, uh, we took together with the snow change, uh, who had uh, uh, had started a landscape reviling project, which is meaning that instead of trying to campaign through activism or juridical fights in courts or trying to find out a way to reason up to the larger society, they started to buy out from the private markets, uh, marshes, uh, uh, wetlands in the protection since in Finland, the biggest carbon trap is in marshes and outgrow forests. And obviously, we wanted to jump in as soon as possible and together with no change cooperative lands gate rewilding program we started to buy purchase restore and rebuild degraded lands after industrial rent and uh, the goal in this work is the as you see from these bullet points but the most of all letting these lands to be because when they're all natural cycles are functioning, they can renew the, themselves eternally. Uh, in this picture is my father and my mother, and in this upper picture is me in my backyard when we were little, and this lower picture is my sister and myself in our dock when we were kids. And uh, despite the misfortunes that my father and mother have had, they have lost four of their children, one thing that they learn from us, learned to us, was this bits and pieces of still functioning uh, system. So this work is very much family knit. 
My closest working partner has been my father and his friends. I've been collaborating with my brother as well. And it has been also rebuilding and renewing and also mending those family ties. Because when we are talking about the gaps in, in the intergenerational knowledge passages, it, it touches every family, including myself. So it has, has been a very long and very private process that comes out to be something called biodiversity or carbon binding goals. And then coming to this Venice Biennale, just showing up the one of the things so because as soon as we started to buy up the lands into protection for snow change and with snow change, uh, I ended up in a situation that I would have more people willing to sell their lands to protection due to family crisis, to some kind of a tra tragedy in the family, since the private land owning has been so new concept in these areas. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't have, I still don't have that kind of a money to have, so I had to start begging somewhere. And when uh, Katja Karti Anton from uh, Office of Contemporary Art of Norway came up with the suggestion to join the Venice Biennale for the Sami Pavilion, Sami Pavilion, I suggested her that uh, can I use this as a this process as a possibility to auction the right to view the landscapes that are under threat and with this portraying of these threatened lands into landscapes and selling off to art institution the rights to see if we are able to buy the lands under protection. And so it happened and uh, currently I've sold one landca landscape and I'm having uh, discussions with a uh, couple of uh, art institutions in Nordic. So if, <laughs> if you want to <laughs> contribute to this work, please let me know. Uh, uh, during that time, it was 370 hectares of private lands that were uh, bought as key pilot areas uh, for, from scold areas, but the, now the, the amount is bigger. Uh, uh, I will go there, but just, uh, just to show up a small glimpse of the map, map work. I don't know if you are able to see Map yeah, now. we can see your slides, Paulina. <clears throat> yeah, just just to give you a bit of, uh, we are running a bit over time. If okay. you could, so, so, I, so I can end here. I can end here. here. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want you to end because I want to know more. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's but fine. Maybe. It's fine because I'm coming. So uh, <laughs> we can. If you have questions or yeah, so we are here for you. Thank you so much, Paulina. Thank you so much, Taru. I mean, <laughs> really, you're doing such important work, and uh, it's so multi-layered and inspiring. And uh, yeah, I'm speechless. So I'll check if uh, we have some questions in the auditorium that want to come to the fore, or online. We also have some public online. Just. Let me know if there's any questions or remarks. Everyone's still digesting. Do you want to? Hisham. No problem. Thank you so much, Pauline. Um, and thank you so much, Taru. And, and it's so great to listen to you because we, we kind of got a, uh, a summary of a lot of things that we have also been speaking about here. Is this idea of concrete action in relation to what art can do. Um, and also this, this notion that, that you said that it's being paid by, the, by an art foundation, right? And you've utilized it in a different way. Um, and then the aspect of data. 
<laughs> in fact, comes back. I don't know if you've seen Bayo's lecture yesterday. So let me start first there. So this, these, are, these are three things, right? Concrete action, data, and uh, what can art do? Those are the three things. So on the aspect of data, you are utilizing data, in fact, to give you a view of what you can do. Um, how do you see that in relation to um, the IPCC, for instance? That gives us a view of climate change that, as well as Taru said, is in fact conservative. So it's politically motivated. But you're using it in a different way. Can you maybe elaborate first on that? Yeah, I try to be short. Like I said, every, t every society and everybody comes from a different background view, mm -hmm. facing the very same big question, climate crisis. And when we are living in Scandinavia, which is one of the most stable places on Earth, mm -hmm. and it seems to be a very juridical society that is having a high, high respect on education and so forth, so in this context, if you want to make a societal change, you have to do it through data. And in this case, it's not about uh, traditional knowledge or arts knowledge versus science. It's, it's more like, uh, as uh, Kaiser Raitio has said, it's more about uh, knowing against ignorance. And uh, Sami, as many other indigenous peoples have been always in the forefront of adapting new technologies. We are always mm -hmm. like very eager to know what are the ways we can expand our understanding new things and, and, and understand the data to be kind of a different languages for different audiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, more I have the languages in reserve, more I'm prepared to have whatever arena, whatever discussion, mm -hmm. and be able to stand in between mm -hmm. whoever the actor is who's going to come and wish to exploit those areas. Yeah. As long as there's a possibility that data still counts, because there are societies in the world currently uh, and, and uh, nation states that data doesn't count. But in this context where data still counts, obviously we are using that path. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and and the, oh, you wanna you wanna ask already? Okay, but that okay okay <laughs> great. Then the second one is the the the, the, the concept of concrete action. Um, you have shown your work in the Venice Biennale, and you've made use of this moment of the Venice Biennale also to utilize the public in order to help. Okay, with with buying rights. I was there and, and I saw it and I really enjoyed it, I really liked it. Um, or thought it was smart. Also it was a very pivotal moment because also the Queen opened the Sami Pavilion and in fact um, acknowledged Sami culture in that sense. This was historic, it was a historical moment. Um, but the concrete action, in fact, how, how would you view your work at the Venice Biennale and um, within the boundaries of your work as concrete action as opposed to art as an artistic practice or as an art representational practice. So in fact, as a maybe as a communications device in that sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, I try to answer that. Okay. Uh, in, um in the Venice Biennale, one of the things of the whole package called matriarchy is the video theater is one is giving a bit of the background of why I'm saying this landscape, what is the need for that, telling that uh, one third of all soil based carbon is bound in the Arctic, so it matters to the Europe and the drying, drying Italy, especially that things will be done in our region well. Uh, one of the things is the catalogue showing the landscapes or glimpses of landscapes of course the proposals for what could be the landscape that is being also on sale and one of its performance that I have a working group of uh, Birit and Katja Harla, Outi Vieski, uh, Sabu Herrala is at the 
Sutin and Hannah Perry and myself. Um, and basically what we were do doing was like, a, a, we are begging in our knees. I don't know if you saw the actual performance, mm -hmm. but uh, that, uh, that having this possibility to come that uh, instead of going and shouting what would be my natural reaction to try to refine it into act of begging and at the same time going on your knees and bowing and showing your leg coming from a background that uh, of being also a slave for the Russian Orthodox Church uh, and doing that in my own terms. It, it has been very, very mixed mixed situation at the same time working with these amazing female bodies and we do with so little of spoken ex oral explanation what we are trying to do and trying to make an integrity uh, within the performance to do that and uh, you mentioned the queen uh, when we were, had the chance to chat privately with her I ask her to, could you please, your highness, take away the dam in Gandvik, which is one of the dams in the Nelda River watershed that, that has been done after the Second World War in the Norwegian side. And it cannot produce that much electricity, but it, it is the reason why in the one part now the river has been forcibly, its current has been forcibly turned mm -hmm. into opposite direction. And she said, okay, well, that could be something that you can collaborate on. And I don't know, just coming from a royal country, that I don't know is the Queen's word worth of anything and how to get back to that. But that, that came out that I, I went there to Venice uh, to beg, like, please, Europe, do something, help. Wow. And uh, then went back home and I have no idea if it, if it made any difference. But uh, in, in to the, to the same kind of way, even though it's so straightforward, activistic act, but in, in uh, having that performance there, um, it, it sounds so stupid to say that it became in some kind of a protection not to be as a person, not a private person, but rather that this is my character who is begging there and the museum leaders from Europe are so, oh, you are so cute, this is so nice that you are, <laughs> you are yeah. begging in front of, in, in, the, in your knees here. And just to, because it's, it's a study of anger and rage for me. Yeah. Because I, I, I'm, and most of the time I'm so angry and I use so much time and energy for that that I even start deconstructing everything. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, you or. did. Yes, yes, you did. Yeah, this is, this is a profound form of humbleness in a sense. Thank you so much, Pauline. Thank you. Um, if anyone wants to... Uh, one more question, and then we uh, we don't have to. No obligation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Paulina Taro, thank you so much again. It was a pleasure, and tomorrow we'll see you again in the in the working group four. Again, thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good to see you together. Right. <clears throat> Ooh. Okay. So. My, our next guest for tonight is the current Jan van Eyck participant, Hira Nabi, who will perform How to Love a Tree. So Hira is a Pakistani visual artist and filmmaker. In her artistic practice, she thinks through vulnerable ecologies, conditions of labor, memories, and temporality. In her work, witnessing is an act charged with radical possibility and one that holds immense potential for collective responsibility and love. I think I need like a um, natural background to describe how to love a tree with a, with a nice soundscape, Hamid. In How to Love a Tree, Hira Nabi 
We'll weave together narratives from misty mountainsides, ghosts of extra extractions, and hauntings of British colonialism and imperial formations, gestures of love and care in Sylvian landscape, which are fast withdrawing. Now we'll wait a bit for the, for the soundscape. I think we'll add a, yes. And maybe the screen can go black too. So we get in the mood. Yeah, almost there. Yes. But I still need to read though. So the light can stay on. <laughs> the light can go up. This is it, perfect. Hamid, you're doing great. <laughs> Some key questions from, from Hira. What does disappearance look like? What traces does it leave behind? What is the texture of rot? And what happens to a dream deferred? In the words of Langston Hughes. I'll give the floor to Hira. All day long, we alternate between mist and rain. Mist that slopes in stealthily, cloaking and shrouding trees, vistas, the edges of things becoming blunt, soft, folding in to become opaque, invisible. The clothes that I washed almost a week ago haven't yet tried. I had left them hanging on the clothesline outside in hopes of tempting out a weak sun from behind the clouds while the mist soaked into them, infusing them with its own smells of rain, earth scents, soil scents, odors of decay, of rot, of excess, of overripeness, of humidity. The mist feels cool and damp. It brings forth ghosts like vapors. The ghosts remind us of deep time, of erasure, evictions, uprootings, untimely deaths. After all, every landscape is haunted by past ways of life. The hauntings and the ghostly afterlives point to our forgetting, showing us how living landscapes hold the residue of earlier tracks and traces. Night falls and the mist remains. I watch the street below as car headlights lose their brilliance, bouncing light in concentric smoky circles and we begin to be disoriented. We begin to lose our sense of time and space. 
and rain, loud, heavy, slashing against the hills, splattering mud everywhere, soaking the narrow trails called Pagdandis so that we slip and slide in the kichar if we attempt to make our way up or down the steep, sloping terrain. We wait. I watch. I spend long afternoons staring into the rain, looking at trees. Their green is alive and spectacular. To watch the passing of a thunderstorm was like watching the workings of the cosmos, something elemental at play. What kinds of imprints do centuries of grafting, cultivation, trade, taxation, and circulating pathogens leave behind? Do their particulate remains continue to be suspended in the atmosphere, the environment? We are bringing the past into the future, where we may pour down as rain onto waiting soils, or flow into a river, slowly gathering secrets, ambitions, When it shatters upon contact with the soil, does it transfer its knowledge from the atmosphere to land? When it touches me, can it change me? I go looking to gather memories and testimonials and a witnessing of what existed before. Where do I begin? Nahi nega me manzil to justuju hi sahi. Nahi visal moyasar to arzu hi sahi. This is roughly translated to If the destination is not visible, at least the quest remains. If a reunion with the beloved is not possible, only longing will have to suffice. Nahi nega me manzil to justuju hi sahi. Nahi visal moyasar to arzu hi sahi. I find traces in strange places. A burnt fireplace from a colonial era hotel. Bricks fired in kilns that don't exist anymore. Wood from trees once rooted nearby. Planted alongside seeds and saplings arriving from distant soils. I am not certain if the wood can be classified as dead or as alive. It is certainly not a tree anymore but it carries something of the tree, an essence of the tree. And in that, perhaps it is alive, resplendent with inherited ancestral wisdom and life ways, and more lore than I can glean by looking at and touching it. I seek out conversations with ghosts to be reminded that we live in an impossible present, a time of rupture, of endings, and of mortality. We are told that we are living in a world haunted by the threat of extinction, and yet we remain unaware that we inhabit a world already becoming extinct. For extinction is a multi-species event, occurring in stages and assemblages. As the anthropologist Deborah Bird Rose writes, extinction is a double death. It extinguishes times yet to come. I made frequent walks in the forest for different purposes and with different companions. Foraging for mushrooms, sometimes tracking leopards, looking for dark bungalows. Surrounded by remnants of colonial infrastructure, I began to perceive a different kind of temporality. A temporality of the forest, the time of daisy blooms, marigold season. Snake season, on and off peak season for tourists. 
monsoon time, breeding season for cicadas, full moon night, I start to sense the ghosts. How can we switch from ordinary to sacred time? I have been advised to do it recklessly, without signal. Back in the forest, I find myself contemplating life and decay and flourishes of life again. The life of a 500-year-old pine tree. The life of a plastic packet of crisps, doomed to exist forever. To be dead, but to never dissolve. The rapid accumulation of plastic trash on the mountainside. The disappearance of spotted deer from the forest which in the food chain were the food of the leopard. The leopard now turning its hunger and appetites towards cattle reared by local villagers and looking for prey elsewhere. What does imperial debris look like? How can we discern the tangibility of colonial past and present? I begin to think of all the ways in which the space was transformed. Relationships between people were severed. Soil was turned toxic, turned into a plantation. Ties between people and place were forcibly broken. And as Anna Singh and Donna Haraway reiterate, the capacity to love and care for place is radically incompatible with the plantation. What were empire making and imperial formations if not plantation making? In the 19th century, following severe outbreaks of cholera, typhoid, malaria, and other diseases including the plague, British colonial administrators enclosed commons across the colonies in South and Southeast Asia to construct therapeutic landscapes as healing zones. At a remove from the perceived urban infested areas, these hill stations perpetuated idyllic settler colonialist visions of pastoral England. What happened to these in-between spaces of English simulacrum in the colonial hinterlands? These sites currently exist as locations of exhausted geography, the land unable to sustain the tourists that visit annually, tracing well-trod pathways in the colonizers' footsteps, continuing to seek the healing hillside air to escape the scorched plains. The intrinsic extractive intent has not altered in the handover from colony to post-colony. The forest is now a strange mix of pine, fir, and trash, as tourism infrastructure has failed to develop efficacious sanitation and waste management. The detritus of humans is a new kind of empire, slowly taking over, engulfing entire forests, towns, streams, and mountains. The debris of capitalist waste and the unspectacular afterlives of discarded things are stockpiled all over across mountainsides. Ghosts of extractive colonialism mingle with neon-tinged apparitions of capitalism in the old new world of hill stations turned into tourist towns, with monoculture, tea plantations, telecom networks, and luxury hotels. How do colonial relations between people and land, or between different species, persist despite political independence? What can we do to co-produce decolonial alternatives? What can relationships of love and care look like in this fragile ecosystem on the precipice of collapse? How to love a tree. Two characters are conversing with each other across time and space. The first, Sajid, 
a local forest guard in Nathyagali, and the second John, the ghost of an imperial botanist who is residing inside a tree for over 200 years until the tree is slowly killed off. Why was the tree killed, you might ask? Until a few years ago, there used to be a law that allowed people to log a dead tree from the forest. You couldn't cut down a living tree, but you could take away a dead tree. In the face of this logic, people started to kill off trees, or to begin the process of killing them by stripping off the bark and then burning parts of the trunk to hide the axe marks. Or they would adopt a different strategy, more swift, by pouring chemicals at the base to damage the roots. That law has recently changed. Now you can't take anything from the forest, dead or alive. Last year, I invited four musicians to play a concert to four different dying trees as a gesture of love and care. constitutes a vast archaeological archive and all the beings that live within and around are speaking to us. Somehow, we have forgotten their language. We have lost it from our tongues and cannot seem to understand or make legible what is being urgently expressed. This is one of the tasks set upon the forest guard and the botanist, to try to recover a language to read the signs to communicate and dialogue among species once more to sense a witnessing of history from more than human perspectives. After realizing that he's now seen John everywhere that he goes and wherever his gaze lands, Sajid asks John, but how are you able to be here with me right now? John, I had spent a lot of time in these forests. One day, after a prolonged sickness, Instead of dying, my spirit was taken in by a tree. Yes, 
the same one that you were examining last week. I became part of that tree and began living inside it. And now that it has been fatally harmed, it's casting out all its memories as testimonies. Somewhere in this conversation, they have entwined their hands. John is tracing out the lines of fate on Sajid's palm. Sajid, why did you reveal yourself to me? John, because you wanted to know how to love a tree. You didn't ask, but you wanted to know all the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hira. Uh, before we go in the break, I'd like to give back the stage to Hira. Do you want to say a few words on Pakistan? Yeah. Thanks, Bruno. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, I also wanted, I'm from Pakistan, uh, from Lahore specifically, where it has rained, but it hasn't kind of been inundated with floods. Most of my country, well, one third of it to, to be exact, but I don't know anymore, um, is underwater, as you may have seen. Uh, it's, I think Pakistan, because it's next to India and China, seems to sort of hide behind its enormous neighbors. But Pakistan is also geographically a huge country, so one third of that is a lot of land. That means people have been displaced, they've been made homeless. It also means that a lot of land is now um, unable to be planted upon, which means that in about four to six months, there's going to be famine. So it's all very dire. Um, and and uh, yeah, I just wanted to kind of draw everyone's attention to it. I know that we live in a world also at a time when we really slip and slide from one disaster to the next. Um, we are probably facing many more disasters that are hidden right now, waiting to show themselves. We are still in war um, on this continent, but on other continents, in other places. Uh, but in the middle of this, there's also, I think also it's pertinent to speak to that um, at this forum. Thank you so much, Hina. Thank you, Hira. Uh, we take a 10 minute break and meet back here for TG Demos keynote. Slowly coming back, we're going to restart our session with um, TJ Demos, who will deliver the next keynote between the IPCC and the COP, Climate Aesthetics as Class War. So TJ Demos is the Patricia and Rowland Rebell Endowed Chair in Art History in the Department of the History of Art and Visual Co Culture at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and founding director of its Center of Creative for Creative Ecologies. Demos is the author of several really important books and recently co-edited the Routledge Companion on Contemporary Art, Visual Culture and Climate Change 2021. He's presently completing a new book on radical futurisms. We're very curious about that, TJ. And you can read TJ's entire biography and find more information on his work on our website. So with no further ado and sorry for the delay, the floor is yours, TJ Demos. Great, thank you, Bruno. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, and I'm really happy to uh, also join my uh, co-panelists. Um, I met uh, Hira Nabi a, a few years in uh, Lahore, so it's great to hear some of her recent work. All right, um, let me begin with my uh, presentation. Um, uh, since the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was founded, 
In 1988, uh, in the first UN climate summit, the Conference of Parties, or COP, in 1995, uh, since then, anthropogenic climate disruption has steadily worsened. Uh, it's clear uh, that capitalist climate governance uh, will not keep us safe. Uh, in what follows, I'll argue for the imperative of recognizing the class base, the class war basis of climate change and for an arts of organizing that addresses it as the necessary means of social movement led transition toward both a post carbon and a post capitalist future. The central problem of uh, COPs, again, the, the UN Climate Summit's Conference of Parties, is their economic framework revealed by corporate and state funding, which is uh, enthralled to fossil capitalism. Uh, looking at the main sponsors of UN climate summits, for instance, uh, this one at uh, COP21 in Paris in 2015, we see lead sponsors <clears throat> coming from the fossil fuel energy sector, uh, financial firms, transportation corporations, reliant, <clears throat> all reliant on uh, and benefiting from fossil energy. Capitalist climate governance, in other words, uh, as it's called by Andreas Malm, frames climate change solutions as necessarily favorable to capitalist interests. But we should know by now, and after so many failed COPs, that capitalism can't solve the problems of capitalism in the interests of capitalism. This owes to the fundamental logic of the economic system and its central contradictions in relation to nature and labor. Uh, as analysts such as Hadas Thier and Andreas Malm and John Bellamy Foster and David Harvey and many others all detail, uh, that according to its laws of motion, capitalism endlessly accumulates economic value, even while it devalues the labor that produces it and the nature that provides for it. Moreover, the economy's prioritizing of profits above all else means that it will never incentivize ecological stability or labor security. It's clear that class interests play out at the IPCC and uh, through the COPs, despite the increasing grave conclusions and recommendations of climate science, and despite liberal protestations to the contrary, that we're all in this together, or that technology will, will somehow save us. The reality is a war of interests, uh, expressive of a fundamental structural antagonism between the class fraction that economically benefits from fossil capitalism, the owners of capital, and the rest of us, those who have to work for a living, the precariat, the proletarianized, frontline and indigenous communities that suffer the consequences of fossil capitalist governance, which works to guarantee the continuation of its political and financial system <clears throat> in the process, sacrificing geographies, multi multitudes of people and ecosystems, even to the point of placing earthly livability of human civilization itself in jeopardy. COP events express this political antagonism familiar to those of us who have followed these events closely for years. Uh, the UN climate summits are strictly partitioned and often violently policed, creating, on the one hand, the zone of climate negotiators, corporate sponsors, and state representatives with their own hierarchies between the powerful and the powerless, who have the privilege of being in the room where key decisions are negotiated and made. And on the other hand, civil society and social movements often taking to the streets in protest, drawing together activists and organizers, demanding the democratization of the proceedings, greater political transparency, uh, the exclusion of fossil capitalist interests and actual inclusivity, especially of frontline communities and those who have experienced the worst of climate disaster. The time between COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009 and COP21 in Paris in 2015 was perhaps the high point of art activist interventionism, a time of critical mass uh, for political hopes that social movements could 
actually transform the direction of the climate summits by countering corporate influence and recentering uh, climate justice priorities, including three central ones. The first is uh, climate debt developed by countries in the global south in the 1990s and reaching full articulation in the People's Agreement in 2010 uh, in Cochabamba when Bolivia and other developing countries hosted the World's People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. The second is the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities, first formulated at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, meaning that mitigation and adaptation uh, capacities are owed by all, but differentially based on uneven, uneven levels of development. And of course, number three, actually binding agreements for greenhouse gas reductions at the statewide level, which the COPs have um, systematically avoided for more than 30 years. In these cases, uh, uh, art or aesthetic practices more broadly have aimed at unleashing collective creativity toward explicit transformative political ends, often correlated with the radical climate justice framing of social movements. Cultural formations, including aesthetic practices, have played an enabling role in raising public consciousness, uh, moving beyond bureaucratic and scientific inform informational communication, and connecting with multisensory and emotional forms of uh, meaning making. They've also operated to bring more critical messaging to public forums in the streets and through mediagenic manifestations, as well as in the media to generate a heterogeneous aesthetic space where form and content merge in expressing alternative forms of gathering and to relay more comprehensive shared political analysis. Doing so, the arts have frequently deployed an intersectionalist framework of climate understanding that goes beyond single issue politics in order to connect to social justice demands uh, of anti-racism and anti-colonialism more expansively and complexly. Climate Games in Paris uh, was exemplary. It, promoted, it was promoted as the world's largest disobedient action adventure game by its organizers the France-based Laboratory of Instructionary Imagination, or Lab of E, uh, a rebellious collective focused on popular theater, permaculture, and protest. The laboratory traces its roots to the anti-globalization movement of the 1990s as, and has ties to the various climate camps, the anti-airport expansion movement in the UK. Climate Games unleashed at COP21 uh, in 2015 invited international participants to enact protest actions anywhere in the world and target UN climate negotiators for repeatedly failing to come up with a plan to address the environmental crisis. Included in the games was uh, Operation Vivaldi by the Zoological Ensemble for the Liberation of Nature, uh, their French acronym EZLN, being a playful spin on the Spanish acronym for the Zapatista insurgency in Mexico. And they invaded, as you see in this uh, image, a Volkswagen dealership in Brussels, its members dressed as trees, monkeys, sheep, fruit, and vegetables, targeting VW <clears throat> owing to recent scandalous revelations that its cars were systematically designed to cheat on emissions tests. Activists ended their brief uh, sortie by chanting the slogan, we are nature defending itself. There was also the uh, inflatable blockade, a blow up blockade with roots in strategies of popular insurrection going back to 19th century revolutionary France and recently reinvented by uh, the group Tools for Action, a European collective that uses inflatables for protest purposes. The air-filled sculptures, uh, so-called activist tools, are ideal for disrupting police paranoia that sees protesters as violent criminals, injecting protective cushioning and a childlike lightness and joy into civil disobedience events. Um, the red lines on the giant silver balloon cubes 
signify the limits of minimal survivability on a livable planet. Uh, the right to soil, the right to water, the right to a just transition, explained Labavi member Jay Jordan uh, at the time. These are lines that cannot be crossed if climate change agreements are to have any popular support or universal validity. The collective, uh, not an alternative, linked with an international coalition, including the US-based Gulf uh, Occupy Museums, the UK's Art Not Oil, uh, BP or Not BP, Liberate Tate, Platform London, Science uh, Unstained, Shell Out Sounds, and the UK Tar Sands Network, uh, uh, to, in order to undertake an unauthorized divestment protest at the Louvre in Paris, an institution sponsored by oil and gas corporations, uh, ENI and Total. Last were examples of civil disobedience, including the British group uh, Plain Stupid, which blocked a road on London's Heathrow uh, for several hours to disrupt the government's plans to expand the airport. And of, uh, there's also the work of Ende Gelände in Germany, dedicated to mass direct actions, shutting down lignite coal mines as part of an ongoing resistance movement to fossil fuel energy. With <clears throat> these small scale and autonomous artistic activist interventions, um, they also interact with a larger ecosystem of NGOs at climate summits, which complexly shape, if not completely determine the ecosystem around COP meetings, providing infrastructure, media networking, media visibility, and policy framing. That means joining forces with what we can call the climate angiocracy, typically including coalitional formations largely made up of civil society organizations, sometimes including trade unions and their affiliated organizations, often liberal in political positioning, meaning reformist, gradualist, and without an anti-capitalist analysis. The climate and geocracy poses challenges to more radical social movement environmentalism. Examples include uh, the grassroots global justice, uh, an alliance of 58 US-based grassroots organizations, groups organizing to build an agenda for power for low-income people and communities of color, then there's the climate space, which began as a venue at the World Social Forum in 2013 in Tunisia to discuss the causes of and alternatives to climate change, developed into a global people's climate process, including a network of 30 international organizations like Attac France, uh, ETC Group, Focus on the Global South, Global Forest Coalition, Grassroots Global Justice, Indigenous Environmental Network, La Via Campesina, um, and the World March of Women, among others. And then there's the uh, mobilization support team of the People's Climate Movement, which consists of 350.org, Align, Avaz, uh, the Blue Green Alliance, Climate Justice Alliance, uh, and others. One problem with these formations, despite their positive gains in policy influence and the good faith motivation of participants is, however, a structural one. NGOs are guided by institutional funding imperatives uh, to guarantee their own reproduction and sustainability over and above any specific policy directives or bids for structural transformation of the dominant economic, political, and donor-enabled system, the very system on which NGOs depend for their very existence. What this can mean in its negative implication was clearly demonstrated at the People's Climate March taking place in September in 2014 in New York City, uh, two days before the gathering of world leaders in New York called by UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon to discuss the November 2015 UN Climate Conference in Paris. Described as an invitation to change everything and critical of the inertia of government leaders, the march was organized by the global advocacy human rights group Avaz and the environmentalist nonprofit 350.org. 
but with nonspecific and amorphous demands supported by nearly everyone, such as to build a safe, just, peaceful world. The march became a site of corporate greenwashing with sponsors of the march, including such corporations as BP, China Mobile, Dow Chemical, Duke Energy, AHSBC, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Chase, and Greenstone, all indicative of what uh, that time's big tent pro-corporate approach to climate action ultimately means. As Chris Hedges uh, responded to that march at the time, he said, our democracy is an elaborate public relations charade. And the longer we accept this charade, the longer we will be irrelevant. Only when we understand power can we fight it. This fight must be waged on two fronts. We must disrupt the machinery of corporate capitalism and at the same time build parallel autonomous structures for self-governance that address basic needs such as food and green energy. Joining exactly that fight and doing so in similar ways that the climate games of COP21 would reprise a year later, artists and activists organized Flood Wall Street as a follow-up to the defanged People's Climate March. Flood Wall Street explicitly targeted New York's financial center responsible for fossil capitalist funding, doing so to radicalize climate justice demands through an explicit anti-systemic, anti-capitalist reframing. Explaining this rationale, the journalist and Flood Wall Street participant, Nathan Schneider, wrote in Al Jazeera America, climate change is war and Wall Street is winning. To make that outcome, uh, even to challenge that outcome, another participant, an organizer uh, in Flood Wall Street, Yates McKee, wrote of the effort's attempt to decolonize climate justice. As he explained about the intervention, he said, informed less by environmentalism as a narrow arena of concern than with a broad, broader vision of collective liberation, the call to decolonize climate justice places climate crisis in a deep sense of historical memory stretching back to the colonial violence at the origins of capitalism itself. This historical vantage point stands as a humbling challenge and question for an action like Flood Wall Street, how to use a mediagenic mass arrest as something more than a one-off disruption concerned just with climate, but instead as a groundbreaking event for a continuous struggle to come, encompassing landscapes of resistance ranging from the Rockaways or the New York site of the disastrous Hurricane Sandy and of crucial practices of climate justice mutual aid to Ferguson, the scene of Black Lives Matter convergence after the police killing of Michael Brown, and to Palestine, the ongoing occupation of Israel, Israel's settler colonial socio-environmental violence. While I'm in agreement with this analysis and its goals, the real question is how to build more than a one-off disruption, but instead a continuous struggle to come, and critically, how to do so with the numerous necessary number uh, for large-scale transformation that can actually disrupt the machinery of corporate capitalism that Hedges calls for. For that, we need to, to do more than um, engage in protests and artistic actions, day-long or week-long events, and more than shadow occupations of hundreds, even tens of thousands of activists at UN climate summits and people's climate marches, given the framework of, of climate change's class war and given its global dimensions, um, I want to argue that we need to build a majoritarian working class movement capable of challenging the hegemony of fossil capitalist power and climate governance worldwide. If we don't do this, we can uh, guarantee the continuation of all the disastrous conditions that we're already seeing today. In his book, uh, Climate Change's Class War, Matt Huber argues for nothing less than that. The central argument is that the climate movement is losing, owing to its limited middle-class social composition 
and generally degrowth-oriented politics that fail to resonate with the many. If we analyze the climate movement, its most common protagonists are indeed members of the professional managerial class, NGO staff, scientists, journalists, think tank and analysts, aspiring profess uh, professionals, professors, students, and yes, many artists. These are largely formed within the higher education systems of deindustrialized countries in the US and EU, not only. Uh, skilled in knowledge work and creative thinking, but displaced in general from sites of production, which are largely controlled by fossil capitalist interests, the members of which are in the minority. If a mere hundred companies are responsible for 71% of emissions since 1988, it's clear who the carbon majors are, the owners of what Andreas Mom calls fossil capital. So if the goal is to overturn those interests, then the climate movement can't afford to overlook the working class that uniquely holds the power to shut down fossil capitalist production. That will take organizing and a recalibration of the framing of radical climate goals. Because the middle class is generally dislocated from production and is much closer to areas of the social reproduction of life, in other words, uh, consumerist activities, it tends to generate and generalize its own carbon guilt as the driver of its climate policy proposals, which are consequently geared toward individual actions of recycling, ethical consumerism, using e-vehicles and renewable energy. In other words, a kind of lifestyle politics of less. The problem is, not only does this fail to transform energy sectors and production systems, as we've seen in the last few decades, but it stokes unnecessary divisions between climate activists and labor, commonly summed up in the dilemma of jobs versus the environment, which is profoundly debilitating to large-scale struggle. It's not that the radical climate justice practices occurring within art activism, some of which I mentioned earlier, are failing to make this argument. Indeed, they are explicitly situating their interventions as against fossil capital and equally against the, uh, the liberal climate governance that thinks it can offer meaningful approaches to climate breakdown within the terms of the dominant economic system. The problem is that the climate movement, broadly speaking, and in specific art activist formations, is inadequately connected to working class composition and the sustained work of organizing. We know that the left is generally disorganized uh, because of decades of neoliberal structural adjustments, corporate globalization and the offshoring of jobs, systematic union busting, labor precarization, social media atomization and disinformation campaigns and more, and as well the extreme right's ongoing scapegoating of migration and its promoting of a politics of fear. But there's no choice other than committing to organizing if we're to win uh, the world we want. Huber's notion of, of class is comprehensive and Marxist based in the objective material relationship to production. As Eric Olin Wright explains it simply, the central class division in a capitalist society is between those who own and control the means of production in the economy. This remains true, perhaps even more so, within the ecological crisis, where it's the control over basic, the basics of living, such as food, energy, land, housing, transportation, etc., that defines the split between working class life or what Huber calls proletarian ecology, which stands at about 75% of society globally, especially if we include unpaid and uh, unpaid labor and care work, and fossil capitalist owners um, and managers, including in extractive zones, industry, electricity, green energy, and finance, at about 25% of society. The climate justice movement's class basis split uh, between the professional class of NGOs, scientists, and academics, and the marginalized of domestic workers, subsistence farmers, indigenous communities who must work to survive, is ultimately, however, inadequate to tip the balance as it doesn't address the multitudes who aren't directly reliant on the land, but rather on markets for living. 
As Huber argues, if we want to build a majoritarian popular movement around climate change, it must resonate with the broad and diverse working class, a working class that is far more uh, ethnically and racially diverse than our standard view of white male factory workers, including low wage service workers in retail, healthcare, education, logistics, warehousing, and other forms of care work. Given wage stagnation, precarization, and austerity budgets with growing populations worldwide experiencing increasing impoverishment, migration, and lack of existential security, any climate justice politics appealing to a broad majority, according to this analysis, must strategically not be a politics of degrowth, a politics of less, but rather a politics of more, more health care, more economic security, more public transportation, more free education, more democracy, more environmental justice, and so on. What's urgently required then, and in conclusion, is a politics of life reoriented toward points of production. There's no shortage uh, uh, or shortcut here to organizing strategic power in the workplace through rank and file unionism advocated by people like Kim Moody and labor notes, through social movements and all manner of organizations building international solidarity and along with it climate class consciousness in order to produce an anti-carbon democracy in the interests of the vast majority of society. While there are many sites of ongoing organizing, often on local scales, a few notable examples stand out, including where artists have joined the efforts. Um, let me, I'll just briefly conclude with the mention of three of them. Uh, one is the movement around the Workers' Green New Deal, a jobs and justice program for the next 10 years founded on initiating conversations with trade unions and asking them what their priorities are uh, instead of attempting to explain and lead from an activist environmentalist perspective. This includes my own work in uh, Santa Cruz, California uh, with uh, DSA or the Democratic Socialists of America's Eco-Socialist Working Group where we're continuing to think through this framework and organize accordingly. There's also the Make Amazon Pay campaign, a movement based on supply chain solidarity to shut down Amazon and empower organized labor internationally, supported by such organizations as the Progressive International that is itself building worker solidarity internationally so as to challenge the spread of internationalist nationalisms and right-wing politics worldwide. The PI includes the movement's dedication to what they call an art of internationalism, standing both for the craft of organizing transnational planetary solidarities while emphasizing the critical role of internationalist art and culture that helps shape our common struggles and desires. And finally, uh, there's the farmers' protest in India, where over 250 million workers joined protesting agricultural workers in 2020 in one of the biggest nationwide and even global strikes ever, uh, called by 10 central trade unions and hundreds of labor associations and federations in order to shut down Prime Minister Narendra Modi's pro-corporatist and anti-worker structural adjustment policies. Critical to the success uh, of this movement was of traditional farmer worker trade union protest aesthetics, including um, uh, um, uh, things like mobile trolley homes, free medical camps, community kitchens and libraries, film screenings, musical evenings, open discussion sessions with popular singers, folk artists, and cultural activists working all in solidarity. While these are still far from enough in terms of what's required uh, to shut down fossil capitalism, it's where we see great progress today toward building the mass political movement that can uh, stop um, the continuation of fossil capitalism and initiate a post-carbon transition that is not simply a matter of techno-scientific solutionism, but a comprehensive politics of life integrating social justice and post-capitalist liberation. Um, 
Okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. And um, I ha I'm happy to ask, answer questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much, TJ, <clears throat> for the wonderful presentation. It's, it's very nice to see the, the connections to the earlier presentation we had from uh, Selchuk Balamir and Teresa Voracino, who showed exactly a couple of, of images from the climate games, like the ones you showed, which made me think of like the iconic character of these images and how they circulate and, and the recurrence of them. Um, and uh, I, I have... I, have really, I can't hear any of Ah. Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Is it getting any better? I will try with another microphone. Hey, DJ, can you hear me now? Wait. Okay, now. Yeah. Now I can, I'm hearing you now. Can you hear me well? Okay. Or is it better with this microphone? Both. Both, both. both are okay. Yeah. I was just um, I was just saying that <clears throat> there are many there are a couple of images that we just saw earlier in a pre presentation by Selchuk Balamir and Teresa Voracino, who are also talking about the climate games, and I have behind me Selchuk, who is who co-developed the creative and strategic framework for climate games. Um, so can you hear? Me? There's a big delay. It seems. Ooh, ooh. internet is not working for us. But I'll open up the question to the floor if anyone wants to ask something. Benefiting from the delay we have. You have more time. TJ, I'll, I'll just start asking my question, assuming you won't hear it for a few seconds. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. I'm really grateful that you've introduced the language of class conflict into this longer discussion that we've been having and we'll continue to have through tomorrow. Um, I guess to keep things simple, I have a lot to say. <clears throat> the thing I guess I want to hear you talk more about is maybe the obvious tension that you're asking us to think about with you, which is in the last 20 to 30 years, class-based politics has been largely uh, delegitimated and disenfranchised systematically and as a consequence of the gutting of the labor of, of like of labor politics in, in, especially in the US and in, and in Western Europe um, strategically dismantling labor politics uh, it's also been the source of vapid and rapid populist sentiment I, sa I say this as somebody who is and was brought up and and continues to identify as working class uh, with a lot of rem a lot of melancholy, um, you're asking us to think about class as a as as I'm a, I think you're suggesting we think about class as a uniquely powerful identity category, precisely because of its relationship to the production process and its capacity to interrupt via socialist forms of organizing. Um, and the examples that you point to are actually quite convincing, I have to say. I, I, I'm, I'm, I feel really good right now. <laughs> you know, after, in most days I don't, uh, when I think about labor politics, around the question of climate consciousness. So there's that. There's that lingering and obvious problem, which is like class politics, for the most part, for ideologically suspicious reasons, has been, has been dismantled and, dis and discursively coded as the site of populist reason. Okay, so can you talk about that a bit? And then the second thing is, there was a kind of quick moment in your talk where you were thinking about um, class and life. You, you, you made the connection between like life and, produ and production, life-giving processes and production. You made that link. Uh, and that's obviously, that's, that's a source of a lot of anxiety for, for Marxists because Marx is not great at distinguishing the, the, the relationship between those two things. Um, in other words, ontologizing labor and slipping the human into that category of production and then making distinctions about types of humans based on productivity levels. So could you talk about that too? Like how do we get, I, I'm convinced by your critique of, of degrowth. How do we think about like a class-based politics that is simultaneous to a, class con, cl a climate class consciousness that's not productivist?
Uh, thanks for that, uh, the, the comment. Um, I, I can hear you. There seems to be a delay, but it, it's coming through clearly. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm making an argument for thinking about uh, class as an unnecessary category for, um, for um, uh, political transformation. I actually... I don't see any way out of this. I think that this is the um, necessary criterion for um, considering uh, how a climate movement might um, empower itself to actually challenge existing forms of fossil, cl fossil climate governance. Uh, there's, there's just simply no way. And I think um, I, I made a comment somewhere in my presentation that the looking back at more than 30 years of the climate movement, it's, we, have to, we can only conclude that it is failing. Uh, it's failing in the sense that it is uh, failing to enact any meaningful uh, policy shifts uh, or, uh, within the dominant site of global, uh, global climate governance, which is the U UN climate summits. Um, social movement pressure, civil um, society interventions, including artistic act activism, have failed to generate any of the central demands or to um, bring about transformative changes within uh, the kinds of policy agreements. And, and there's lots of uh, critical literature demonstrating the failure of COPs repeatedly over and over again. Uh, even right now, there's been um, a, a call for a climate strike this week by Fridays for Future and uh, 350.org, I think it's another um, unfortunately ineffective and inadequate proposal for how to enact um, political transformation and specifically uh, advance the goals of meaningful climate justice. So I think really the only way of, to do this is through um, the, the, the powerful mechanism of political transformation that we, that we have even if the left remains and the working class remains profoundly disorganized uh, today. And that is through, um, through withholding labor and through the strike form as a way to force positions within, uh, within management and within governance by uh, generating uh, a social movement that, that can actually uh, shut things down. I, I, I just, I simply don't see any other way that, that any kind of, uh, uh, meaningful political change will happen un unless it's done through a rethinking of, um, of social movement uh, strategy. So I, I, found, I, I found that there's a really um, important proposal put, put forward in, in Matt Huber's book, uh, Climate Change is Class War. That's just one example. There's many others. Uh, lots of people are increasingly trying to make this argument. Um, this means confronting the exactly what what you were referring to just the profound uh, you know dec multi decade long systematic disenfranchisement of working class power but uh, there's i just i again i see no other way than to uh, try to work toward turning that around and beginning to commit to organizing as the strategy to um, enact transformation that means, yes, I was trying to uh, reiterate this call for a politics of life. Uh, this isn't meant to be, uh, this isn't like a vitalist politics or anything like that. I think it's, it's, it's fundamentally Marxist uh, in the sense that it, it recognizes that, um, that working people are, that labor ultimately is the source of ultimate value. And um, that is where the um, responsibility lies for the uh, reproduction of our conditions of uh, civilizational existence. And so if we're to challenge the conditions of um, ruling class governance, that is the way and it's the only way that I think can work through the threat of leveraging labor power by withdrawing it from uh, participation within the reproduction of conditions of, uh, of production that are, as we know, putting in jeopardy our continued existence. So um, that phrase, a politics of life, is meant to direct itself toward a politics uh, that sees itself as um, labor assuming the agency 
to actually um, uh, um, take control of its responsibility in guaranteeing the reproduction of, of, of uh, productive possibilities. Um, so that means, right, like in a, in a very simple way, it means um, less about um, uh, climate activists d making demands to politicians like so many social movements do from 350.org to Fridays for Future to XR to, um, to Greenpeace and more about <clears throat> committing to making demands in workplaces where um, uh, we can uh, encourage a form of labor empowerment that threatens to, to, to stop operations because there's a fundamental realization knowing that if we continue with the productive cycles, we're continuing to uh, destroy our chances for uh, survival in the future. And that needs to be the, the site of collective organization, consciousness raising, um, specifically in relationship to uh, these uh, I, you know, ideas of, of, of climate and environmental justice. That's intersectionalist, that's in solidarity with international struggles. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, that's what I'm trying to think with and, and, and work toward. Well, thank you, Jeff, for the contribution. Thank you, TJ, for the answer. Um, we're running ahead of time, so <clears throat> I'd like to thank TJ for the amazing presentation and uh, see you tomorrow in the assembly. Hope you have a good day. Want to take a while? See you next time. See you tomorrow, TJ. And after two online presentations, we, we need to get back to the to the vibrations that David brought earlier. So to conclude our day, our full day today, I'd like to ask David back again on stage and Himali uh, immaterially also to perform Healing from Meteorites. And Healing from Meteorites is an essay about the redemptive potential of catastrophe, originally written by artist <laughs> Himali Singh Soin in collaboration with Alexis Ryder. And for this performance, uh, read excerpts from the text will enter into conversations with sonic improvisations by drummer and composer David Soing Tapezer. So maybe worth introducing you both again since new people joined online and here. So Himali is a writer and artist based between London and Delhi, and she uses metaphors from outer space and the natural environment to construct imaginary cosmologies of interferences and entanglements. And David uh, is a drummer, composer, and performance artist based between London and New Delhi. And his practice centers around ideas of time, interdependence, and alterity. So that being said, David and Himali, the floor is yours. Um, perhaps if I say just a couple of words from here, is that fine? Or should I use the mic? Hi, so um, most of you have met before. Uh, I have the difficult task of uh, bringing this evening to an end. Um, and I know it has been a heavy day of thought and kind of intellectual work. So uh, Himali and me uh, started working a lot with sound, I guess, during COVID as a response to kind of the visual overstimulus of being on Zoom all the time um, and uh, in the kind of transitioning out of COVID period. Uh, which I hope we're at the tail end of right now. Uh, this gained another layer of relevance as we started doing live performances again, but uh, continued insisting on this dimension of, of sound. Sound also as something visceral, as touch, in a period where touch was not necessarily possible. Um, and also kind of connection. Um, all this to say, uh, normally we uh, try to have our performance in these um, environments which are very much inspired by thoughts of uh, radical hospitality, making people very comfortable, really getting into the zone. Um, so I would like to do this almost in the dark and um, I invite all of you to get really comfortable, kind of switch off a little bit. I mean, unfortunately we don't have map, uh, mats for the floor, but uh, um, but yeah, be comfortable and just phase in, phase out, uh, enjoy and 
perhaps we can connect this to the to the beginning of the day, the sort of oneric um, ritual we started with, transitioning back into that space. Interstellar beings must necessarily pass through a series of thresholds, affects, before they land on Earth. What do they accumulate on the way and how do they change in substance or form through the succession of strata? And what do they bring with them? Splashing into warm lakes billions of years ago, it is possible that meteorites leached something vital into the water starting a chaotic chain reaction that led to life itself. The assemblage is between two layers, two strata, say Deleuze and Guattari in a thousand plateaus. While theirs is not a dialectical argument, we suggest a messier osmotic mesh in which hierarchies completely dissolve and new possibilities emerge. The meteorite is advent non-duality and oneness and emptiness at once. In order to make meaning from a meteorite, we must not simply think of its mysterious origins or its temperamental points of rest, but of what the geographer Nigel Clark might call its stratobiography, a story of traversals of the deep, sedimented time of the Earth itself. And for this, the a positive question might be not only where, but when do I belong? Like other rare and seemingly unexplainable natural phenomena, such as earthquakes and monstrous births, reports of meteorite falls were for a long time understood as signs of divine portents or dismissed as fanciful fabrications. As late as 1790, a meteorite shower that fell on Barbotan, France, witnessed and attested to by 300 citizens, was dismissed in the Journal de Sciences Utiles as an apparently false fact, a physically impossible phenomenon. Little scientific interest was directed at these seemingly fabricated stones. How can these get a mono? monstrously odd rocks as described by the Japanese Antarctic Research Expedition of 1969 fall from the air anyway. What can being in time with a meteorite teach us, we began to wonder, before it is consecrated by the cold whiteness of ice. Meteorite is an articulation of catastrophe. Until the mid 17th century, abrupt change was more legible than an endless, unwavering temporal plane. Naturalists suggested spontaneous generation or sudden, sharp showers of stones during full moons to explain town stones, dark, triangular, serrated rocks that we now call fossilized shark teeth. Tiny, toothy catastrophes. 
In Antarctica, meteorites appear like tungstones, arriving as strangely shaped black instances in sheets of blue ice. Multiply the scale, zoom outward into the cosmos, and their arrival is as spontaneous, as temporally surprising as a rock suddenly forming teeth. The meteorite hunters know this as they scour the sheet in an attempt to travel through time. Frozen meteorites cradled in ancient ice. The tongue stones of the cosmos. As if they had something important to say in a language of their own. Catastrophe is etymologically derived from the Greek word for an overturning of fortune much like the process of discovering a meteorite. A futile and arduous search undertaken with the ever-dimming hope that one of the many rocks overturned might have its origins on another planet or the moon, often even just the detritus of a planet that didn't form, a piece of primordial matter that didn't congeal into a world. The word catastrophe originated simultaneously with the word disaster, rooted in the word astro, implying a sense of misfortune under the influence of the stars. Rooted in the word astro, but by the 19th century lost in geology. As T.C. Chamberlain shrugged in 1890, the geological significance of meteorites is that they have no geological significance. As mines were dug downward to extract matter, the holes themselves began to tell a tale. Encoded in the strata was a natural history of how Earth had changed, geologically and biologically, through time. How these changes happened was a point of contention. Did the palimpsest beneath our feet suggest sudden, absolute, catastrophic change, an erasure and renewal of life on Earth? Or did it suggest a slow, gradual evolution of change, docile and constant? The latter won out, and geology embraced the world of uniformitarianism, change that was knowable and gradual. No miracles, no sudden shocks, free of a deus ex machina. Tides were pulled by the moon and seasons dictated by the sun. But the rocky planet was, at its core, a closed and self-producing system, free from the influence of the cosmos. But just because we couldn't see them didn't mean that meteorites weren't arriving intercepting Earth with the time and matter of the cosmos. It was a chauvinistic assumption that rational science could will away catastrophe. In divine justice, lunacy herself intervened to prove these scientists wrong. Through the 20th century, the moon was recognized as a mirror of Earth's past. Covered in a million craters, speckled with cosmic interjection. How could two celestial bodies, joined as they are at the hip, have such different stories? 
How could the moon be so dented and earth unscathed? Of course, hidden beneath its lively skin, earth bears the truth. Craters so vast they make you weak at the knees, the residue of impact so forceful they shifted the geology of the entire planet. Meteorites may change everything, imprinting on Earth a shock of heat and light, a tremulous beginning of nearly everything. The full stops of such large encounters are now known well. The Cretaceous collision threw mud into the air and coated the world in iridium, a clear mark in the strata of beginning end. But can catastrophe be understood as something less absolute, less sudden, the constant insistence of the presence of otherness? These monsters arrive endlessly on Earth to remind us, as planetary geologist Ursula Marvin suggests, that Earth hurtles around the sun along a path that is gritty with interplanetary dust and rubble colliding violently and sensuously with morsels of cosmic ephemera. Could the catastrophic event of a meteorite falling on Earth be a geological glitch, an interstellar error? Legacy Russell calls the glitch a catalyst in her manifesto Glitch Feminism, which, quote, prompts us to choose our own adventure and turns the gloomy implication of glitch on its ear by acknowledging that an error in a social system that has already been disturbed by economic, racial, social, sexual, and cultural stratification and the imperialist wrecking ball of globalization, processes that continue to enact violence on all bodies, may not, in fact, be an error at all but rather a much needed errata. Quote, As objects that simulate emergence, insist on the relationality of strata, remind us that nature iterates multiplicity. Can the meteorite provide us with a different way of knowing, a disturbance that strengthens our resistance? Russell insists that, quote, this glitch is a correction to the machine and in turn a positive departure, quote. With the accumulated knowledge of its ancestral journey, could meteorites be an invitation to begin again? In much of Himalayan Buddhist born and animistic thinking, a catastrophe such as a violent storm or an earthquake spells a good omen. The earth shook when the Buddha attained enlightenment. Earthquakes can also herald the reincarnation of an important teacher or yogin. Comets and shooting stars like rainbows can also be interpreted as a message from the heavens communicating the rebirth of such persons or their location when search parties are looking for them. Can a simple anodyne rock fallen from the distant past overturn our fortunes for the better? Help us heal from the bruises of the present? 
Our ancestors' traumas reside in the deep jungles and vast deserts of our bodies. Cosmic grief is not dissimilar. The catastrophe of meteorites can perhaps inform our understanding of how to cradle those histories into radical new futures. Can something as simple as a rock falling from space onto Earth form a crater of possibility? If its presence suggests a not knowing knowing that releases us from a measurable, hegemonic, patriarchal system, then its preservation allows for other bodies, black bodies, brown bodies, bodies in transition to live with their own moldable rights and rhymes and reasons. The meteorite desires refusal. It wants to deny your claims to its body. Deny Anne Hodges who lays claim to it through the blue of her bruise. Deny the institution's vitrines. Deny even those for whom it is sacred and who revere it. It wants to say no to being named, becoming a taxonomy, something secondary to science. Meteorites articulate difference, insisting on a capricious potential for change materialized in matter. The meteorite says, we will always all have different lithologies. It bounces off the radio, insisting on illegibility such that it cannot be decoded. It knows that real freedom lies in the ability to interpret. We are many and not monolithic. We are marked and metered. It says we are made of kryptonite and sugar both. We are not normative and our trajectory is guided by the weather alone. The meteorite asks us to look up so we can sift through strata gingerly in a generative and judicious way. Look up where we will see it streaking across the skies, not downward with the territorial impulses of early explorers and dream. Look at us with geopoetic wonder, it begs, not with the cunning utilitarianism of geohistory. We are our own medicine. We are reverse, inverse, obverse, queer. We are otherwise. We are clocks without the constraints of time.
I'm invited to the reception downstairs. Thank you very much, David. See you all tomorrow at 3. <laughs>